The line between exegesis and biblical theology is not bright red. No. No. One is actually doing both when one is doing either, though one may be doing either or both poorly. (laughs) But nonetheless, you, you have both of them operating at some level with some intentionality. Now, Al, when you start that way, that makes me nervous. No, we're we're going to a good place here. Um, But when you listen to someone give a talk like you just gave, you hear things that make your mind want to immediately spin off and go in a different direction. But one of the things that struck me very much that biblical theology reminds us is a distance between our world and that world is in the the function of inheritance. Yes. Because in our world, inheritance primarily means wealth or at least something of value. Whereas in the biblical world, inheritance primarily means identity. That's right. Uh, This is my son. He thus inherits what is mine. And I just think that's something we have, when that distance is there, I I think we have to come back and say, you know, this just redefines for us what inheritance is. This really isn't about the house, the farm, the business, uh, this is about who in his, is and is not the son. That's right. And, and, and therefore, inheritance is experienced w- without the death of the father, right? We don't come into our inheritance until somebody's died. Um, and and it would be really useful, it would have been a different talk, to have done a biblical theology just on inheritance. And you would have, you would have had an opportunity to kind of pull all that stuff out and, and make some of that distance right. But I think that's, a, I think that's extremely well observed that a big part of biblical theology is understanding this, this, this cultural and historical difference and the difference that that makes in our reading. Absolutely. Brother, thank you. Thank you for serving us. Um, it was just a rich feast. I was uh, thoroughly encouraged, particularly by, by point three, your mm. point three on the security of our inheritance. The, the sentence uh, you said, uh, stop reading uh, this uh, idea of sonship through the lens of our felt needs, but read through the Mm storyline of Scripture, which is just great, just application of what biblical theology is. Um, One one question I did I did have was in your in your last point um, where where you're speaking on uh, obedience. uh, You you said that that our assurance of God's love is not apart from obedience, but, but through Even as I said obedience. that, I knew that you were going to ask me about the child. <laughs> that, that, I, yeah. that I was going to? Yeah, I knew that you would ask me about that, even as I said it. I, and I almost said it differently. And I thought, no, that's fear of man at work. So I'm just going to say it the way I plan to say it. How could you have said it differently had you been more fearful of man child? <laughs> well, of course, what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about, it, it will sound in one sense that I'm, I'm suggesting that uh, that, that in some ways are, well, let me, let me put it this way. At that moment, I'm talking about works, our obedience, in the way that I think James is talking about it. As evidence. As evidence. Um, not, and yet it's, it's easy in our context, I think, to assume, oh, he's, he's having a Pauline discussion, um, as if somehow our, our works are justifying um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really thinking about it in terms of the way James thinks about it. I'm talking about it at that point the way John talks about it. Mm-hmm. We simply cannot talk about having assurance that we are in the light, that, that, that the, the love of the Father is in us, unless we see light in us, unless we see obedience. Mm-hmm. So, so I, I guess my, my question would be how... Uh, so, so, in other words, so really what I'm pushing against there is a kind of antinomianism, uh-huh. a, a desire for assurance that, that I'm okay, that I'm saved, that my ticket's punched, uh, and it kind of doesn't matter how I live. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I don't think that's consistent with the biblical storyline. Right. And Neither do you. Agreed, yeah. right. But I, I think my, my, my question is, how, how do you reconcile that with... Um, what you just said earlier about, man, I look within and I don't see the, the well done. Because the natural question is going to be, well, how obedient are we, are we talking? Right. right, sure, yeah. And this is where, is where I think the, 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 the New Testament is teaching about progressive sanctification and the fact that our Christian lives are 
already not yet. You know, there's, there's, there's an inaugurated life of the kingdom in us, but the fullness of that life, the, 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 the full expression, the completion, the consummation of that life is not yet here. Mm. Um, so, of course, we're going to see um, uh, gaps, right? Mm. Yeah. And I, I think, honestly, at least in my experience, pastorally, you, you address that case by case. You address that pastorally. Mm. Um, you don't change the formula. You don't, you don't, you don't change the, 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 the verbal uh, formula that, that John gives us or James gives us. Surely part of the, the work of the local church that you mentioned in, in your message is to help us go on in having that confidence correctly. And that right. cheerfulness getting about the work correctly, the local church calls us out of just ourselves, and we have a, a, an objective witness around us that is testifying that, yes, that we see the fruit of the Spirit, or no, you are actually walking after the flesh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I, th I think that um, the, this issue of how many works do you need to have, how much righteousness to have that well done, spoken, uh, uh, so, some ask me that when I, when, when I talk about this particular doctrine of uh, perseverance. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember, I don't know who said it, but it's a Puritan saying, I've been told, uh, that, uh, you know, what I, the point is, what I, what I once was, I now am not. What I now am, I will not be. In the sense, I'll progress in godliness from this point on, and ultimately I'll be uh, uh, perfected. Paul doesn't give a scientific formula. He does say in 1 Corinthians 6 that some of you were uh, homosexuals and thieves and murderers, but you have been washed, you have been uh, justified and sanctified, so there's, there's a difference. And um, uh, I, I do think that the uh, well done, my good and faithful servant uh, is certainly ultimately our position in Christ, but also at, at the end of the day. Um, uh, you know our, our our works, which will be seen in Christ, but they will be they, they will be, be good seen. they will yeah. be good works. And and you made that point uh, early on. I can't remember your phrase, but I liked it. <laughs> that, that was John Newton at Family Prayers. It was. It was John Newton. Did, did you agree with the way Michael put that? The thing that's bothering Shy a little bit about the the uh, intimacy and obedience going hand in hand in the story of the Son. Well, I, I think both are involved. Is as, as he said, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is it helpful to think in terms of this obedience uh, word and connect it lexically to hearing or listening? Uh, so Adam is rebuked at the fall for listening to the word. Mm -hmm. When the great Shema comes, it's hear, O Israel, this word. When Jesus speaks in Mark 4, uh, it's listen. And, and in the very last word in Mark 4, even the seas listen to him. I mean, they obey him. I, for me, keeping the law is a real downer, mm -hmm. and obedience is usually connected to that concept. Fulfilling the law, well, that, that can happen. I can fulfill the law as I love, but I can't keep the law. And, and so I'm continually bringing myself back under the hearing of the word, the listening to the word, wherein my life fulfills something. Um, at least that's about the only comfort I get at times, is trying to connect those ideas. Any thoughts on that? I think it's really helpful. Um, I mean, I think even uh, the, some of the parables Jesus tells, right? The parable of the two sons, the father ask the two sons to go out in the field and work, and, and, and one says no, but then goes and does it. Another says yes, but then doesn't do it. So, so which, one, which one hurt his father? Which one obeyed his father? Uh, so there is this, this real connection between listening and obeying, and to, and to hear the word of God and to submit to the word then, yeah. to be under the word. Is the word is the work of obedience. John, Jonathan Le Lehman and I were talking after my talk, and uh, he, he made the Im important point, I think, that's, that's helpful for us to realize that in, in our cultural context, to be, to be obey, to, to obey, to be obedient, feels like to be, you know, to be under, to, to, to be uh, under a taskmaster, to be under a rule or a law. But in the biblical worldview, to be under authority is to be in authority. 
uh, the way we, by obeying God, we rule. By obeying God, we display his, his character. By it's obeying, a position of blessing. It's a position of blessing. That's right. So, so o- o- obedience, the, the, the son obeys the father, and in that obedience, he reigns. He accomplishes the rule of the father. It's a very different perspective, I think. Is it because we think that what's good and right has to fundamentally be generated from inside us? It has to originate in us? And that anything that doesn't originate in us is somehow oppressive? Oh, that's an interesting thought. I, I can imagine that that would certainly be a, a common in our culture. I don't know if I can say that's everywhere, but... Guns, other things? Sean? Yeah, so just, just to kind of push, push, push back more, a, little, a little bit more. So... So, so correct me if, if what I'm about to say is, is off in your, in your opinion. Mm-hmm. So, so it seems to me that we are in Christ where we're not free from obedience, but we're free to, free. unto obedience. We're free to obey. Mm-hmm. Right. We've been given a new identity. Right. We've been given the spirit. We've been given a new power, a new nature. Right. Whose nature is to obey. Okay, so, so, so my thought is that the, when, when, I, when I think about assurance, the, even the ground of my assurance, I'm immediately inclined to look to the Son, Jesus, mm-hmm. and look to his obedience and the fact that I'm justified by faith alone apart from works of the law, and that that, you know, being rooted and grounded in that reality of justification, now I'm free yes. to pursue obedience knowing that even if I slip, which I will at yes. some point, yes. that I have the rock-solid foundation of the justifying work of Christ. Yeah, I mean, I think what you're doing right there, I, I want to say it's both and. And I think you're just walking through First uh, John there, right? So, uh, on, on the one hand, uh, John, you know, makes it very clear uh, that if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, right? So, but, boy, we need, we, we need justification by, by, by the grace, by the blood of Jesus Christ. We, we, we are desperate for that. Um, but, but right before that, he said, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, mm-hmm. we lie and do not live by the truth. I think there's a both and at work here. Not both and in the sense of both Jesus and my works are the ground of my justification. Mm-hmm. But, but I think both are at work in my experience of assurance. Mm-hmm. That when I sin, as he goes on to say at the, at the beginning of chapter 2, that when he, he writes, as John says, I write to you so that you will not sin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But for those who do sin, well, we have somebody who speaks. Uh, we have an advocate. Mm-hmm. We have a paraclete, Jesus who speaks on our, our defense, in, in our defense. Um, so, yeah. so it's a both and. So I, I, and, and I'm, I'm with you. I, I, and I think the, so you used this phrase, you said uh, that where our obedience doesn't have to be this kind of grudging thing, but we can kind of obey cheerfully mm-hmm. under his authority was the mm-hmm. phrase that you used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I guess that, you know, just thinking just from on a real practical day-to-day yeah. level, what it looks like to be cheerfully Mm-hmm. under his authority, um, it, it seems to me that the, having that ground of justification right. is, exactly. makes all the difference in the world of it being cheerful. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, okay. that's exactly right. Uh, otherwise, it's, it, we're back to law-keeping. Yeah. Okay. I found that a very confusing conversation. I'm sure. <laughs> to be honest. I'm sure. Sorry about uh, that. Yeah. I'm try, trying to plug into that, but it seems to me that this I is what Christians have been talking about this for a very long time, and uh, we rarely improve upon Augustine in, in yeah. discussing something like this, yeah. and his four states comes immediately to mind. Yeah. The state in which it is possible not to sin, mm-hmm. then the state in which it is impossible not to sin, yep. the state in which it is possible not to sin, and then impossible to sin. Right. Boy, and, that cleared it up. Well, it does. <laughs> but that's, that's it exactly does. If, you walk, if right. you walk through the meta narrative, it really does. Adam chose to sin. 
we all sin because Adam sinned. Mm -hmm. Once we are united with Christ, we are then able to obey in a way that between Adam and Christ, there was no obedience in that sense. And now we, being united to Christ, can't obey, but we still continue to sin. Mm -hmm. We're looking forward to that time when we are not able to sin. Non passe, non peccare. Exactly. And so in the meantime, we're living in the world in which we are united with Christ. The ground of our justification is Christ. The ground, anytime we use the, use the word ground, that ground is Christ. That's the right. ground of our assurance is Christ. We are in Christ redeemed, and we are in Christ kept, and we are in Christ forgiven. We continue to sin. We do not sin, even as Abraham sinned. Uh, we, we, we are united with Christ, but at the same time, we do sin, as Paul writes very candidly of in Romans. And so we press on. And we, we, you know, who shall save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we have to say both things. We have to say both things loudly, both things honestly, and end with victory in Christ. Yep. And I think if, there's, if, if I emphasized the place of our obedience in this particular talk, I think it's because my sense, from where I sit, if, if there is a, a danger that we in more reformed circles face, especially amongst younger Reformed guys, it is to, it, to fall into a kind of antinomianism. Absolutely. That, you know, Kevin DeYoung's recent book on, on the whole in our holiness is, I think, really trying to helpfully address that. And, and Michael, I appreciate you saying that because that's the only thing I would have come and strongly said behind you. Yeah. When you talk about we should look for the evidences, mm -hmm. actually, they have to be there. They have to be there. It is not something we hope to find, no, but amongst the redeemed, there. they must be present. And if, and if they're not there, then we lie and we, we have deceived ourselves. Yeah. I liked the image you said about the diversity of the family mm. drawing attention to the greatness of the Father. Yeah. Mm. You know, what does this Father be like that all of these you know, yeah. represent him? Yeah. That was a, a wonderful observation, I think. I, I think that... That, that was another place where I feel like we, we as evangelicals need to remember that most of these identity markers that were given in the New Testament, they are corporate. We are so quick to individualize and privatize the mm. faith and to, and to think about our discipleship solely in terms of me and Jesus. Mm. And, and yet, uh, the vast majority of those identity statements, including the family statements, sons, sons and daughters, family, children, they're plural. Hmm. We, need to give, we need to give more thought to how we give expression to that in our ministry, I think. Hmm. I'm in the middle of a series on discipling right now, and Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 says, follow me insofar as I follow Christ. Uh, is that creating kind of sons in the faith? Does that fit into this yeah. sonship well, image? Yeah, and Paul does that a lot, doesn't he? I mean, because he's, he's, quite, he's quite happy to refer to himself as a father in the faith, to Timothy, he even talks about Timothy. Timothy. He, he, he talks about Timothy following him a, as, a, as a son to his father. Uh, we feel, I think, really uncomfortable with that, but maybe, and, and because we live in a highly egalitarian society and, and nobody can, can suggest that they're better or ahead of anybody else, particularly not in the church, um, and, and yet we're probably really hurting ourselves in our, in our discipling ministries because we're unwilling to say, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm a father to others in the faith, and I should be, be because I'm a, I'm a son of the Father through Christ. So, oh, yeah, it, it's a powerful image. It's, I just, when, you, when you think about it, you, you begin to realize that that the reason that there are sons and fathers in, and daughters and fathers in our experience, in created reality, is because that relationship, that reality already existed in the Trinity. So, and this is why it's so powerful in our lives, because it's, it's tapping into something that is essentially true about God himself. Um. Prince, anything else? Well, I like the way that you were, you know, tapping into that storyline, and because uh, I think when we read the New Testament and we think of Jesus as Son, uh, often we think only of deity, right. which is true, 
but there's also a functional element there. Right. And um, uh, and that functional element is that he's faithfully obedient, as Adam should have Adam. been. Yeah. And as Israel, the should've corporate been. Adam should have been. That's why Israel's called a son, as you beautifully pointed out. And and throughout the Old Testament, Hosea 11, 1, again, yep. out of Egypt have I called my son. And, th and then when we think of ourselves as sons in Romans 8 or Galatians 4, we, we, we tend to, uh, at least as almost a default mechanism, to disassociate it from the Old Testament. But we are in Christ, as you so beautifully uh, mentioned. And if Christ is the Adamic slash Israelite son, he's true Adam, uh, eschatological Adam, he's the true Israel, then we are true Israel and true Adam in him. Yeah. And uh, I, I think that really brings that biblical story in, in, into uh, uh, our own midst in this New Testament epic. And I think it's very important to see ourselves as, as part of that uh, redemptive historical storyline. And, and at that point, then the image becomes profoundly rich and complex. So not to take away at all from the element of it, of affection and love, fil filial affection and love, totally true, major part of the story. It's just, it's so much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden it becomes an identity that uh, is, is big enough to kind of drive the whole Christian life r rather than one emotional piece of it. It's 3.30. If somebody wants to pursue this more in writing, any suggestions? Martin Hingle, Don Carson, Greg Beale. Uh, Greg's stuff is fantastic. I wrote my talk. Thank you. And Thank then you. I, I, I wrote my talk. You know, he was a professor when I was a student at Gordon-Conwell. So everything I know, he gets to take at least partial credit for. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. So I, I, I wrote my talk, and then I thought, you know, I better, like, go check this. Um, <laughs> so you could get a concordance, but instead you reach for Beal. Well, no, I've been, I had spent, I literally, I literally spent three days looking at every use of the word son or sons and father in the whole Bible. That must have been edifying. It was deeply edifying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, just trying to make sure I was immersed in the storyline mm -hmm. and, and then could think through some of those lessons for it. Um, so I, you know, I write it out. But then just, and this is the way I do all my sermons, I write the sermon, then I, then I go look at the commentaries, make sure I didn't like blow something. And where did I go? I went to Greg. I, I went to his uh, Biblical Theology of the New Testament and was deeply gratified to see him talking about all the same themes. So That's very encouraging. It was hugely encouraging. I'm just curious, who here has used Greg's, Greg's Biblical Theology? No, don't theology you dare ask Testament? that Come question. On. Okay, I've used it. Michael, one of the only ones. Put your hands up if you have. Encourage the brother. Don't lie, but encourage him. I mean, if you've used it, put your hand up there it's for It's big and it's yeah. intimidating. I totally get it, but it's worth it. And it got great indices in the back, which are helpful. Yes. It's, got a, it's good as a doorstop in case you don't use it for anything else. It's really useful. Anything, anything else, brothers, in, in writing on this? Uh, on sonship? Yeah. Doesn't Packer have a, a good chapter on this in Knowing God? Packer has a fantastic chapter on this in yeah. Knowing God. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Right. Super. Michael, thank you for serving us in this. See you guys back here at 4 o'clock.